really like it now to introduce our second speaker today, Professor Michel Dagan from the University of Leeds. He's going to talk to us about what is microscope and how the microscope has evolved over 350 years. So please welcome Professor Michel Dagan. Well, like any good microscopist, I've brought my microscope with me, so I'm, I'm going to pass this around. This is actually one of the earliest microscopes. It's, it's not actually a real one, because I can't afford a real one. But this is a replica of the Leeuwenhoek microscope, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, but I'll, I'll, take, I'll start passing around, because there's a lot of you, and it might take some time. Please make sure I get it back at the end. So it's going to be completely different because I'm not going down to anywhere near the atom, although there, uh, with the electron microscope, of course, one can get down to the atom if one really wants. Mostly I'm going to be talking in this part of the, um, the, uh, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the development of the microscope, which is more around here, and then I'm going to go into super-resolution microscopy, and then I'm going to do, if I have time, because I've got quite a lot of slides, we'll do a bit on electron microscopy at the end. So I just wanted to start by saying, though, just for a little bit of explanation, that really when microscopes first started to be um, used, there were two main types of microscopes. A very simple one, which is this simple microscope, which is a single lens, um, where you can just, you just have a single lens and you can see your object, you can see the rays going through the lens, and then there's the image here. It's a little bit like um, up in the top there. And then the second type is the compound microscope, where you have two sets of lenses. And the, the, the advantage of that is you get a slightly magnified image. So you, by the time you actually see the image, it's bigger than perhaps if you can um, see with a single lens. So that, I, that's just a bit of background, because I'm going to talk a little bit about simple microscopes and um, compound microscopes in terms of the history. And in fact, the first types of microscopes that really were made were these um, simple microscopes, and they kind of came out of the, of the time making um, telescopes as well, and also the spectacle makers. So it was just at the point where people were getting quite good at making glass with the Venetian glass and so on. And so the Zacharias Jensen and his, uh, sorry, I'm just and his, um, and his father here, they made, this was thought to be probably the first type of compound microscope. So a compound microscope is with these two lenses. And it had a sort of barrel that you could slide across and, and try and look at objects. And in fact, that became much more famous. I'm not sure you, because it's be, recently been the anniversary of, the, of Micrographica, the publication of Micrographica, and this is Robert Hooke. Now, it isn't really Robert Hooke, it's a, a drawing, because in fact, Robert Hooke fell out with Newton, and Newton had all the pictures of him destroyed. So this is a, a, a potential p picture of Robert Hooke that, from, from descriptions of him. But this is Robert Hooke, and this is his microscope, which looks very beautiful. And it's a compound microscope. So actually, you can start to see all the different components of it here. So there's the eyepiece, here's the barrel. There's a, a way to focus up and down onto your object. There's an objective. And he had this problem of actually trying to light his specimen. So you've got an oil lamp here and a flask, which is sort of like you might have as a condenser on a modern microscope, as a way of getting a, 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 as a, even illumination as you can on the thing that you're trying to look at. Um, you can draw that as a proper ray diagram if you, if you really want. Um, so that was the microscope that supposedly he used to produce these rather beautiful diagrams. So, of course, Hooke was the first person to describe the cell. This is um, some cork where he's drawn this rather um, beautiful structure. Um, and he measured them. So he knew how to put a scale bar in his micrographs. And he coined this as um, looking rather like these structures as looking rather like cells, so he called them the cell. And this is a, probably his most famous drawing from that book, which is his diagram of the flea. And you can see it's really very detailed. You can see all the details of all the little small hairs on the flea, um, and it's uh, very well known. In that book, he describes how he makes his lenses. Now, of course, he says he's using a compound microscope, but some of us secretly believe he was actually using a simple microscope. This description here of how he, he makes his um, um, 
glass bead. So basically it was, it was melting glass in a flame, making a little round globule and then um, working on that to, to make it the right shape to make the lens. And the person who read this book, so this, when this book came out, it was fantastic. Everybody went and bought a copy, who could afford a copy. They went hook read, read this book and was absolutely um, amazed by what you could see. So he read the instructions on how to make that lens and he designed his own single lens microscope, which is the one that I'm passing around. Who's got, who's got that microscope now? There you go. So something, the, the microscope that you've got passing around is, is Lehman Hook's original microscope. You can see there is this pin here where he would be putting his specimen, that's where the lens is, and he's looking from the other side through that lens onto that pin. You can adjust the, the position of the pin towards and away from the lens. You can move, um, you sort of adjust, so sort of focusing, if you like, of what you're trying to look at. So he wasn't a scientist. So Hook, as we know, is a very famous scientist. He was an FRS. Um, he was also known for uh, um, his discoveries in many other aspects of science. Lehman Hook was just a, an amateur microscopist. He was just a draper. But he had this very strong interest in what you could see. In fact, originally, perhaps, to look at the textiles. But then, and because you can see that rather nice, beautiful, small microscope, which he designed, he would take around in his pocket and look at lots of different things. So there it is in a bit more detail. There's, this is actually, um, I think, my replica microscope. There's a single lens, a simple lens. That's where you would put your thing on the pin, perhaps held on with a piece of wax or something, screws to adjust the position of the pin. That's another little diagram of it. So he made a lot of different microscopes. If you look on the, there's a lovely set of web pages about Lewin Hook. He made lots of different microscopes. They had different magnifications range from about times 85 to about 266 times. So he could really see quite a lot of detail with his microscopes. So, now here we come to the crux. He could actually see more detail with his simple microscope but then, in fact, we think Cook could see with his compound microscope. Um, so these are some pictures taken by Brian Ford. This is an image of the flea taken using Hook's microscope. Uh, this is, a, is with a, a modern microscope and camera. And this is with Lewin Hook's microscope, but actually being able to see quite a lot of detail, which you cannot see with Hook's microscope. So that's an, an interest, interesting conundrum, because obviously, Hook did make single lens microscopes as well as the compound microscopes. So maybe he actually used a combination of the two. So in fact, it was Lewin Hook who had the most successful microscope, even though he had, came slightly after Hook. His microscope was actually better at imaging. And he was able to look at all sorts of things. So he took some rainwater. Um, this is some water with some things swimming in it, perhaps something similar to what he would have looked at. He was able to see small objects, and he called them these animacula, so, or possibly living atoms. So, of course, these aren't living atoms. They're actually living organisms, but he, he was absolutely fascinated. He could see these things in the rainwater. So, he reported his findings to the Royal Society, he didn't actually write in English, but um, he sent them in and they were translated. But the problem was the hook microscope couldn't see them. At that point, the hook microscope that had been developed couldn't see them. So I don't know how to, this could be fake news. I don't know, it could be fake news. <laughs> but, because um, <laughs> apparently the original letter was long. But you can see the original, when, the, when he first sent this letter in and they didn't really perhaps know who he was and um, you know, they thought perhaps, perhaps he'd had a little bit too much to drink because he'd seen these things swimming around in the water. Anyway, <laughs> this is actually the real start of the scientific endeavour because they were intrigued by these findings and Hook was tasked with going away to see if he could repeat this experiment by improving his own microscope in order to be able to see them. So he went away and was able to confirm these findings and these were, of course, the first observations of small, really small organisms such as bacteria. So, of course, the microscope became very popular. Here you can see the microscope being used in many sort of ways and looking rather like a telescope. But 
um, there is still this problem. So why couldn't Hooke see really well with his microscope? And the problem is the lenses themselves. So the lenses themselves have two problems with them, two main types of aberration that we worry about even now. One of them is spherical aberration, and the other is chromatic aberration. So in spherical aberration, it's just because of the way um, the lenses, uh, the rays, uh, do not focus nicely to a point. You can partly get around that by having a stop in there, so you just um, limit the, the rays that you can actually see, the ones that actually do come to a focal point. Or chromatic aberration. Now, the chromatic aberration, and you all know this, you've all seen a rainbow. If you, sh if you shine white light through a prism, it gets split up into its different wavelengths of light. So when the light goes through a lens, the same things happen. The blue light goes off in a different direction to the red light etc. So you get these chromatic distortions and because of the spher spherical aberration you get um, a blurry image. So that was a really big problem and this is one of the reasons why this, in fact the simple lens microscopes were the most popular until um, quite well for the next couple of hundred years really. And so I just put this rather nice picture in. This is a simple microscope. You've got a choice of lenses here. So just a single lens. You've got a stage here where you can put your specimen. You can rack the stage up and down in order to be able to focus. Um, you have actually a, a special fine focus me mechanism down here and then a mirror for <coughs> illuminating your specimen. So this was something you could buy for a few shillings from um, George Adams' Universal Microscope. So to get around the problem of um, chromatic aberration was a problem that took a long time to solve and it really be became easier to do when people started to experiment with other kinds of glass such as lead glass and so on and also the realization that you could put um, um, a convex lens next to a plano convex lens and that would also help in, um, in correcting for um, these kinds of aberrations. So, in fact, it was Lister who um, was playing around with this um, and he, he made um, a combined achromatic doublet um, compound microscope where he, he did manage to correct somewhat for chromatic aberration. But there was still a problem that you can't see a lot of detail because the best you can see the resolution which you're going to come on to was only about a micron. So this, we're starting to get into the 1800s now. I was very struck by the last talk and where this seems to be where really um, the story of the atom is taking off as well because this is a big, um, of course, um, increase in our scientific activity. And I just wanted to mention this. So I'm the current president of the Royal Microscopical Society and the Microscopical Society started in 1839 and it was basically a bunch of blokes who went down around this ass to have a bit of a chat about microscopes. <laughs> Um, and, and this Quackett, there is still the Quackett Society, which is for amateurs. But, um, we're, um, we're a royal society for looking at microscopes. And, the, and they did, you know, they commissioned microscopes and so on. And they got their royal charter in 1866. So a couple of years ago, we had our 175th anniversary. What really happened then? So what, how did we get to the, micro, the light microscope that we have today? And it was really these two people, Carl Zeiss, who was a machinist, so he was a, an industrialist, really, um, and Ernst Abbey, who was a trained physicist. So apparently, the story I have been told is that um, Carl Zeiss liked microscopes. He built them for people, so at that point, if anybody wanted a microscope, they would be able to buy something, but it would never be the same as the next microscope. It was all a bit sort of hit and miss, and nothing was the same as anything else, and you never really knew exactly how this microscope was going to perform. And Carl Zeiss was very frustrated by this, so he <coughs> teamed up with Abbe, and Abbe went away and actually worked out the theory of how these microscopes were actually imaging, how they actually worked, in order to be able to get a, um, a standard image. So the first thing he did was he solved, he solved the... Um, problem of colour correction, chromatic aberration, and that happened also to help with spherical aberration as well. So he did that, and he was helped by Otto Schott, who um, helped him develop the right sort of glass in order to be able to make the right lens to correct um, for these aberrations. 
So that was um, communicated to the, the RMS. And he also um, defined the aperture. Now, the aperture is basically how big the hole is, how much light you can get in in terms of your microscope. But that's very strongly linked to resolution. So what do I mean by, or what do we mean by aperture? So the, this is a lens with low aperture, and it's really just a small hole, so not many of the light rays from your object here can go through the hole. Um, sorry, I'm doing it the wrong way around. They're coming, they're coming this way down. Here's a, and here is a, a lens with a large aperture, and you can obviously collect a lot more of the light. Linked to that is if you're trying to image an object where everything that you're trying to image has got wide spacing, so it's well, well separated spatially, you, um, the light goes through and it gets diffracted and you can see these rays, rays here. And you want to, what you want to do to get the most detail is collect all of them. If you look at something with close spacing, then in fact the rays get diffracted <coughs> even more. So in fact these ones out here are difficult to collect and you lose, this is the high resolution information because these are small spacings between the objects. It's really hard to collect these rays out here. So having a wide aperture means you can collect more of, of the high frequency information or the detail information. So this is what is limiting of the resolution in a microscope is, that is the aperture of your lens. This is just a, this is um, just showing you how light goes through something on top of the objective. So you can see that cone of light. So perhaps another way to just explain that is light is, is considered like waves. So if, if your waves, if your plane waves are hitting a slit, they get diffracted on the other side, so they start to go off in different directions, just like waves going through a gap in the rocks. So the diffracted light gets scattered. Um, so if you, this is the amount of light you can collect through your numerical aperture, through, through your actual aperture in your lens. <laughs> so um, what, rays that don't get diffracted very far, so from the, the highly separated, well separated spatially uh, objects will go through, but the, um, the, these waves here are not going through the aperture and they're from the really fine detail in your specimen, so you lose that detail. What that effectively does is that when you try and image your object, instead of seeing a nice sharp spot, this is what your image already looked like, this purple spot here, in fact what you actually see is something that's very blurry with these rings around it. And that's the airy disk, which was again linked to astronomy and George Airy, and it's the same problem when you're looking at the stars. So we come up, so Abby came up with this very uh, well-known um, relationship between the distance between those two points, so how well, so how well separated spatially your two points are, the, the distance there, linked to the wavelength of light and numerical aperture underneath. So the, the bottom line is you, your resolution can never be larger than about half the wavelength of light. So that is our physical limit. We cannot see anything smaller than that. And just to demonstrate this again, if you look, think about that blurry point there, um, and that's just plotted as a Gaussian because we're now looking at a camera, so we can, do, um, we can actually look at the change in intensity as you go across there. Plot that. If, if you have two spots very close together, you can just about separate them. But really, um, the further away that they get, it's really easy to separate them. So if that was two spots there, and they're too close that we can't resolve them, here we can just about resolve them. And here they're far enough away that we can very properly resolve them. And we, so we can only resolve um, based on um, how blurry that spot is and how, felt for how um, well separated the, the two spots are. And that was something also brought up by Raleigh. It's just a little aside here is that um, there's also an importance of the immersion medium between the objective lens and what you're trying to look at. And this is just a letter, of, so there's some correspond, a lot of correspondence between the Royal Microscopical Society and Ernst Abbey. So Abbey would write to Stevenson, <coughs> Stephen would write back, and they would do lots of drawings and work something out. So it's actually Stevenson at the RMS who um, put forward the idea of 
um, needing immersion. And that's just demonstrated here. So if you have, um, if you're trying to observe something here, there's, there's your um, image just under the cover slip. Here is your front face of your lens. The rays are going through and then they get diffracted because of the difference in refractive index between the glass and the air. They all get refracted. If you put some oil in between the two that matches the refractive index, then you don't get that bending of the light and then you collect more of that um, uh, you collect more of this um, um, high frequency light and you can see more of the detail. Anyway, so that, that's a sort of bit of the history and perhaps, you know, by the 1930s you might have gotten a rather standard microscope now where you've got your objective lens, um, uh, sorry, you've got your eyepiece, you've got your objective lens, you've got a stage that you can back up and down and some way of illumination. And in fact, the RMS also played quite a key role in this in defining the tube length so that you always had the right separation between your objective lens and your um, eyepiece. And even the screw fitting. So when you screw in and out your objectives, you could swap your objectives from one microscope to the next. Um, so you have to have the same screw thread, right? So the RMS was very helped to set these standards. So the microscope technology itself was getting quite good at seeing to quite high resolution now. So now we're just limited by the wavelength of light. Our resolution is roughly about 250 nanometers. Here's a cell. It's, you can see, typical cell. It's a cheek cell. It's about 20 microns. You can see the nucleus there. But we can't really see any detail within it. We can see the cells very beautifully, but we can't see any detail because there's nothing in there. There's nothing, no contrast. So that led to development of contrast techniques such as phase contrast and DIC and something called dark field, but it's still non-specific. So then people started to use stains. So there are different stains that people came up with. So that you've probably all heard of Golgi who invented um, silver staining and he's well known because he in, um, described a structure in cells called the Golgi. Um, and also for neuroanatomy. So these are brain cells. This is run on Hikajab for the uh, brain staining, staining of the brains, looking at cells. <coughs> H&E, which is we still use today, hematoxin and eosin, which comes from um, bark of particular trees, where you can start to see at least the difference between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, and you can start to see the arrangement of cells and tissues. But I think the really key um, uh, development was fluorescence. And fluorescence, you can see, um, I've just taken this out of one of the papers in general microscopy, first described by George Stokes in 1852. Um, and this is the principle that if you shine light at something and it's got fluorescent properties, it will emit light at a longer wavelength. So this is something called the Stokes shift. So here is the molecule, the fluorescent molecule absorbs a photon, it goes into a higher energy state. It drops a little bit of energy, and when it does that, it emits a lower energy photon as it drops down to the... Sorry, it emits a lower energy photon as it drops down to the ground state. But you can see it's, it's blue here, and it's emitting a photon in the green. And the, one of the dyes that was around at the time was, was fluorescein, and you can see here is a jar of fluorescein. It absorbs the blue light, and it fluoresces in the yellow and the green. But actually, the first fluorescent molecule that was discovered, you can do this at home. You could get your blue laser from Amazon, and uh, you can do exactly what I've done here. Usually, I bring my tonic water or my gin and tonic with me, um, and I get my blue laser out. But this is just a blue laser going through tonic water. This quinine and tonic water is fluorescent. And if you um, just have normal water, um, it's not. You can just see the blue laser going through. So then, if you combine, I mean, this is sort of fast-forwarding a few years now, but if you combine fluorescence, if you can label something like an antibody, which will recognize a specific protein with fluorescence, then you can actually work out where a particular protein is in a cell. So you start to see a bit more of the detail. Now, epifluorescence microscopy took a long time to really establish because the, you'll notice normally... Um, so everything, I think, in terms of the microscope at the moment is 
we have a condenser down, sorry, we would have a condenser up here, we would shine our light through, um, just trying to think which way around it is, no sorry, it is down here, the condenser would be down here, you shine your light through the specimen, you collect the light through the objective and then you'd see it up in the eyepiece here. But with the, epifluorescence, the problem with epifluorescence microscopy is you need to be able to block the, emit, the excitation light and only see the emitted light. So that took a while to solve and eventually it got solved not until the 1960s, in fact, with um, this method that we all use now where you shine your fluorescent light through the objective um, and we have a dichroic mirror here and then the emitted light goes back up through the dichroic mirror and through a barrier filter so you block the excitation light and only see the emitted light. And that, um, so there's, and that in the bottom there is the little dichroic mirror. So that solved um, being able to see fluorescence really easy without any nasty background. But the next problem to solve was this, and this is, um, this is the plane of focus where we're trying to see our object. And outside and below are all these fluorescent objects in, in free space. What we want to do is see these objects, but not these ones. So how do we get rid of that out-of-focus <coughs> fluorescence? And that was a, an invention called the confocal microscope. And that was Marvin Minsky in 55. And this is the, the procedure. So you, here is our object being imaged. And if you follow those light rays, you can see it goes through this, they go through this pinhole here. But these <coughs> rays down here, which are out of focus, are blocked by the pinhole. They go off. They, they actually land just to the side of the pinhole, so they, they can't go through the pinhole. So only um, objects actually in focus can be imaged, and you get rid of that nasty out-of-focus fluorescence. So these are two bits of terminology. Then this it might be a standard wide-field microscope. Perhaps many of you might have one of these or access to these, where this is the more sophisticated confocal microscope. And hopefully... They will play. So you can just... This is just a, um, I'm going to come to GFP later, but this is a fluorescently um, labeled protein in a live cell, and you can see how it's recruited to particular structures here and moves around um, vesicles and so on inside the cell. And uh, here, in fact, there are two labels, but you can see these green vesicles again, and you can just see they're a little bit sharper than they are here, and you've got less of this blurry out-of-focus out background for us. So, of course, you know, then lot of people started to make lots of different fluorophores. In fact, this is still happening now. People are still inventing lots of different kinds of fluorophores. So we can label ourselves with multiple things. So here is a cell labeled in green for one protein and red for a different protein and with a dye for DNA. And then you can combine that into a rather beautiful image of a dividing cell, and you can see where the different proteins are. But as, as you might think, well, that's, this is actually a fixed cell. What happens in, in a live cell? How do we get rid of that out of, out of fluorescence? Well, of course, we can use confocal. I just wanted to briefly mention this technique. This is called total internal refraction fluorescence microscopy, which actually makes use of the fact that light rays get... Um, bounce back and you, if you have a high enough angle of your incident light it just bounces back rather than going through your sample at all but there's a little what's called an evanescent field here and all of this stuff here you can't see it doesn't get any light to make it for us but you can see in this very narrow about 100 nanometer um, region here you can see the fluorescence and so you can start to image single molecules. This is, this is a molecule moving up and, and down the structure inside a cell to the end where it's accumulating. So we can look in live cells and the reason why we can look in cells was because of this. And this really revolutionized looking in live cells. Haha, -ha, that's where I'm going to run out of time. GFP. So GFP comes from um, the um, a jellyfish. There are lots of fluorescent proteins now. You can label your proteins with anything and you can look in multiple colours. <coughs> okay, well, I'm going to really run out of time massively. Out. I'm going to very briefly talk about this for one minute. Then th we, we have this resolution problem. Um, what's, uh, a Nobel Prize that was won uh, last year is to use different types of microscopy that get over their resolution problem. 
One is to use structured illumination, which basically change, halves the frequency of the um, emitted light effectively, so everything that you can't normally see because it's too high frequency gets halved, and then you can see you get double the resolution. There is a, a process called STED, which uses a donut laser in that confocal type of mode to reduce the size of the point spread function, or that blurry spot and then the blurry spot becomes smaller so objects can become closer and you can see those and then there is something called palm and storm which is a trick where you can switch on fluorescent molecules one at a time and then because you can very accurately know where those molecules are you can um, make a, an image sequentially so it's almost like a join the dot picture you image one molecule in one frame and then, then another molecule and then another molecule and then another molecule and um, push it all together. So let's see, I've got a little, that's a little animation of that. And you can <coughs> see this here, this is, our, this is the, the blinking molecules, this is the wide field image, and this is positioning exactly where every molecule is, um, it, so that you can build up a really detailed image at about um, at least 10 times better resolution. And in theory, you can get to zero resolution. So just going to spend my last minute, because I really have run out of time, in just reminding you about electron microscopy at all. So electron microscopy is the really the new boy on the block because, in fact, it was only really um, started to be worked on at the end of the, the 1800s, and it was really Rusker in 1931 that um, <coughs> developed the electron microscope. Um, it's very much like a light microscope, it just uses magnets instead of lenses, but of course because you're using electrons and the, and the um, wavelength of electrons is much shorter, you can um, see much more detail. Electron microscopes look rather sophisticated now, these are two electron microscopes we have at Leeds, you can just see the person standing next to them, so you can see how big they are, and you, if you look inside um, the guts of one of these things, they look extremely complicated, but you can see a lot of detail with them. So this is what we can see with the super resolution image. This is a, a protein that was um, investigated by one of my colleagues. This is what the EM image of it looks like. So you can see that we can see even with super resolution being about 10 nanometer roughly resolution on average, here we're seeing a lot more detail. Here are nuclear pores that we can see here as a confocal image. This is the, the STED approach that I mentioned. You can see how everything becomes much sharper. But this is what you can see if you go into the electron microscope and you can actually build atomic structures. So cryo-EM is now so advanced we can actually build atomic structures into, into these proteins. So, <laughs> it's good that you let put my three minutes up because we all knew we had too many slides. <laughs> um, but, um, I, I, again, it's just to remind you the, the sort of typical um, types of things we might see with a visible microscope or a few microns, but with super resolution now we can get down even perhaps to about a nanometer, but of course with the electron microscope and the fact that we're using electrons as our light source rather than um, light, we can, can get down and even see, as we saw in the previous talk, you can see pictures of atoms, but certainly we can see with cryo-EM, um, we can see structures of proteins and we can work out how, how the um, amino acids in those proteins are organised. So that's it. Sorry, that was a bit of a whirlwind talk, wasn't it? Thank you. Thank you very much. So just one, I've got, a, I've got a prize for the best question. <laughs> this is actually a, 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 what's called a folder scope. So this was um, invented by some people in California, and it's to try and get a microscope into everybody's lives. That's everywhere, anywhere. These cost about a pound or something. Um, and the idea is that they get used in Africa in places where the typical microscope where we might use is completely useless. But I brought this along because, interestingly, this is a single lens microscope, just like the one that's being passed around. I don't know where it's got to now. There we go. <laughs> so it's, it's, but it's the modern equivalent, I think, of the label in kind a of way. So I don't know. <laughs> if, if anyone really wanted to have a folder scope, you have to make it yourself. That's the only downside. Um, I do have a folder scope that you can look at.
Uh, I just think it's worth a mention, the other half of the microscope world, those of us who look at solid things with, ref with reflected Material light. Science. Oh, yeah. yes, 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 true. The metals yeah. are not transparent, so... No, 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 no. But no. an awful lot of the same principles still work. Um, people do. I think even use convocals to look at material science, don't they? Yes, absolutely. I'm a biologist, right? <laughs> it's going to be biology focused. I'm interested in uh, why, why do people uh, choose certain colours for certain proteins? What, is it, do they, do they are, you, are you thinking of the other colours in order to kind of make them stand out more? Or what, what's, this, what's the logic behind the colour choice? Uh, when I put the multicolour yes. image up, you mean? Uh, no logic at all. So we can put, make any protein, any colour we like, because the proteins themselves have no colour. We're just choosing which fluorescent dyes no, to I put on. No, I understand that, yeah. yeah. I, I just wondered if, if you're looking at certain colours that stand out more or from one another, are you, is there kind of uh, some visual logic for, for that? Um, there can be. I mean, we te so for example, in that image, the DAPI, it's a DAPI dye that's, that binds to the DNA, which is um, a short wavelength emitter, so that would normally be, we'd be using blue, if you like. It would, be. Um, and then the green would be what we call a 488 dye, so it's emitting in the green, and um, the red is a, a red dye which is emitting in the red. So, in other words, we tend as microscopists to put the image up, sort of that reflects what dye that we've actually used to label it. But I could have swapped them around. Yeah. I could have made the green red and the red green. I, I mean, I could take them into my favourite Photoshop program and, and make them purple if I want to. I mean, I can make them any colour I like. It's, it is more partly to make it a visually appealing, but also easy to see the detail. So even what I stain with them, I don't have to... If I stain it in the red, I can show it in the green, I can show it in whatever colour I want. Yeah. Hi. I'm interested in this idea of resolving something and when it's binary, like you can or you can't, or it's a continuum and how that evolved over time. So you didn't really talk about photographic plates. So photography, I assume, becomes important because instead of doing a line drawing where people say there. they can yeah. you know, do it, or photography means that you can try and say something on this continuum. But I wonder if you can comment about that because that seems to be where a lot of controversy lies. So, so the physical limits on resolution do come from the physical properties of light, your microscope. So actually, we are still stuck at 250 nanometer resolution. The SIM approach, which uses this pattern to bring the high frequencies that we cannot normally see into a lower frequency, is the only one that truly, truly breaks resolution. The stud does it by a trick because it, it makes the... I, th I think I'm just interested in the historical perspective. Well, so so the, that is, the history is, in, in the late 1800s, Abbey worked out the theory, and it, that didn't change for 100 years until people thought, why are we stuck with this limit? And then it, starting in the 70s, 80s, people started to work out how they could overcome that limit. But, in, but it's, tri it's trickery. It's not a real... I'm saying we are actually still stuck with that limit. It's trickery, and we have ways of overcoming it, but it's all by using tricks with fluorescence or... I had a question about time resolution. So you've spoken about static images, but um, is there sort of development of seeing how things happen in time, and is that also depending on what scale you're using and what method? Or? Yes, that's, that's a, a very good question. So actually, just to, sli so, cause you, the, just to slightly answer that last question, so the resolution, there is, you know, you have to use cameras, and cameras have a certain pixel size, but it's, that's, that is irrelevant to actually what your resolution is. The time resolution is a good one, because of course now, these days, we, we are using so in your phone, in your camera, you will have a CMOS chip in your iPhone or your Android phone or whatever you've got, if you've got a smartphone. That CMOS chip is the same as we use in a lot of cameras. Um, we use a scientific version of that, which is slightly better. Um, it, it's more uniform, etc. Um, so you're limited by how quickly you can collect the photons, transform them into electrons and do your readout. CMOS chips are actually very good at that because they collect photons and they read out in a particular way that means they're very fast. So they can go up 
a frame rate is probably something like 200 frames a second, which is very fast. We also use another type of camera, which is still pretty fast. It's still 50 to 100 frames a second. So that's the kind of time scale you can go up to. Mostly what we want to watch doesn't go that fast. <laughs> <laughs> and the other, the other thing is that it's a bit like the Schrodinger's box thing. The more you watch, the more likely it is not to, you know, to have a different bit. So in fact, if you, if, you, if you keep... It's not really like the Schrodinger's box. If you, if you watch something, you're shining light on them all the time. And the big disadvantage with the fluorescence is it tends to bleach. So you lose your signal. So if you do go for 200 frames a second, then... By 200 seconds, you know, by the end of the second, you might not have very much light left. So, so I don't know if you know, in the, in the turf image I showed, with the little molecule going along a structure, it, kept, it was on a loop, and you could see it getting dimmer, and then getting brighter again, and then getting dimmer, and that was simply because we were watching it, in that case, at about 40 frames a second. And as you watch, it gets dimmer. But that's the sort of time resolution. When you, interestingly, for the cryo-EM, um, we also take movies now, so, um, so most of the EM, the high resolution stuff that I was showing right at the very end is done in cryo, and that's done with a very similar sort of camera, another sort of CMOS camera, and you actually take a movie, so you, you image your sample and you take a set of frames, because when you first shine your electrons on your cryo structure, there's a little bit of melting and a little bit of movement, and then you have some frames where you're where everything's nice and stable, and then eventually your sample gets destroyed by the beam or starts to degrade. So there's a few frames in the middle where it's really good, and then you can average those together and improve your signal to noise. So we even use movies in CryEM to, to get structural information from proteins. <coughs> uh, yes. Um, about 30 or 40 years ago, um, Professor Birchup Bristol and Imperial was working hard on depospheric for the UV, uh, driven by the, if you like, the biological sciences. But also in parallel, of course, we've had uh, 10 nanometer resolution in microelectronics within the UV. Um, simple question, why has that not transferred to uh, biological studies? Um, it's because cells don't really like UV light. I mean, I th I th if you want to do any live cell imaging, um, UV is a real problem because cells <coughs> don't survive it very well. So if you illuminate with... I, I, I suppose the other thing is the availability of dyes and so on. If you're, so there aren't so much choice for dyes in that region of the spectrum. They tend to be more into the visible spectrum. OK, let's go up to a factor of two in wavelength and then stick it blue and just make the optic twice as big. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. I, 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 think, I think it's, again, probably limited by the performance of the dye. So, for example, for the, for the um, when we're doing sil single molecules for doing um, where we do this technique where we can switch molecules on and off in order just to be able to see one fluorescent molecule and work out very precisely where it is, you would think that the UV would be best for that. And in, in theory, it is. But the best dyes are all at 647 <coughs> nanometers. And they seem to have the best characteristics for this blinking behavior that you need in order to be able to switch the dyes on and off. Whereas we don't have any UV dyes that have that behaviour. So it, it, it just shows you how it's not just the microscope, it's not just the wavelength. There are other considerations like how well the dyes perform in terms of a particular I have, application. I have a suspicion it's actually just the huge demand that the microelectronics industry can, can bring to bear. I, I mean, about a decade and a half ago, I know they were using uh, monocrystalline UV lenses and one of my students, happened, he worked for Carl Zeiss, happened to mention it was called the 24. And mm -hmm. I asked him, what did the 24 mean? Oh, well, the customer demands them in inches. Oh, really? That's a single, <laughs> that's a two-foot diameter lens from a really? single crystal uh, really? transmitting it around 200 well, nanometers. So they're really, it can be done, yeah. but it, obviously there's got to be uh, enough zeros behind the so, dollar sign. So, well, so that's the other issue. So, so there is um, another type. So there are an absolute plethora of different sorts of microscopes now, and I didn't have time to talk about all of them. 
One of them uh, was designed in, in Glasgow where it's called the meso lens, where the lens, I've seen it, is, because normally the lenses are about this big, this lens is about an inch across, I think. But they had to have that specially made. And um, so the advantage of that, that lens is it's got a really big field of view. So you can see a whole um, Drosophila embryo or something in, in one picture. Whereas with a confocal, we would have to take a little picture here and then one here and then one here and then stitch it all together. With the Meso lens, you can see the whole um, embryo in one shot because the field of view is so big, which is lovely. But they had to have this lens specially made. Um, I, th I think if you wanted to buy them, I don't think it's commercially available now. You have to, if you wanted to do it, you'd have to go to the same company and get this lens made for some significant amount of money. And it was a significant challenge to actually make it, of course, because you still have to get around spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, and other kinds of aberrations in order to be able to make that lens. So that when they made it for, the, for this researchers, they said, we can't guarantee that we'll actually be able to make this lens for you. Many thanks. Thank you very much.